Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Uh, and the first question that I have is a question to the room, which is that how many of you, can I see a show of hands, please, have a Facebook account and have derived some enjoyment from sort of that Facebook account? OK, about, I think, half. How many do not have a Facebook account and probably wouldn't consider it particularly having a Facebook account? <laughs> Okay, well that's interesting because I gave this presentation in the UK at the Cruise Bereavement uh, Conference a couple of years ago in which the average age of the room was probably around 75, I'm not kidding, I think that was the average age in the room and, uh, and the show of hands was quite different uh, and I think that I might have phrased it differently sort of saying how many of you think that Facebook and social networking is the work of the devil and everybody's like, I think it's the work of the devil um, and so that was a hard room uh, and I also spoke to another at first I spoke to another difficult room at one point where I didn't realize that the knowledge, the level of knowledge about what actually Facebook was and how it worked was actually quite limited. So I kind of launched in this presentation that supposed that they kind of knew what I was talking about. Nobody knew what I was talking about for an hour. And so I'm going to give you a slightly kind of potted kind of a summary history of, of what Facebook is about, not just in terms of, oh, you click this and this is how you do it, but what I see a Facebook profile and a Facebook community is actually constituting in terms of what kind of entity it is, because it has some sort of surprising qualities that might not be immediately obvious once you, until you really delve into it. And I think it's important for considering why it's important in bereavement um, and why posthumously persistent Facebook profiles, those that stick around after users die, are so extremely relevant to the work of everybody in this room who works with bereaved children. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more uh, with more emphasis about why you need this. I'm going to give you some statistics about kids on Facebook um, and, and then give a sense of what Facebook sort of is and sort of uh, means kind of in life and, and then in death. And then thinking about how some of the grief processes and grief theory that you'll probably be very familiar with translates into an online context actually quite well. Um, give you a quick rundown of some research and then finally implications for practice. You reckon we'll get through all that in this time? I'm told that I speak faster even than the Irish, the average Irish person. So this could be a little bit scary, so do keep up. Um, so in terms of why you need this presentation, congratulations on the launch of the pyramid. I think it's a really helpful tool and resource. And what I want to emphasize is this is basically what I'm about to say to you is relevant to all of these levels. And it doesn't mean because uh, somebody is utilizing Facebook uh, after their friend has died to mourn and memorialize them that they must be at level three or they must be at level four in terms of their need. Um, this is going to be relevant right across the board. It's very, very much part of normal mourning and memorialization now. Um, so everyone who works with bereavement will see it and will kind of need to be au fait with how it's being used and not jump to the conclusion that it must mean some sort of complicated grief or something more sinister might be going on than uh, what you'd expect. Okay, so we're dealing with level one and level two and right on the way up. Kids aren't even supposed to be on Facebook. Um, you're supposed to report a child if you're aware of a child being on Facebook who's under the age of 13. Uh, and if your underage child uh, created an account on Facebook, you're supposed to help them delete the account. Of course, most parents have facilitated their under 13 child being on Facebook because they say, oh, all my friends are on it and I don't want to be left out or whatever. And parents being parents say, okay, darling, I will help you put up a Facebook account as long as you agree to have me as a friend so I can see what's going on. Uh, so that's what usually happens. Uh, and in 2011, uh, 7.5 million children under the age of 13 were using it and there were 5 million under the age of 10. Uh, and obviously that will have increased since then as the population on Facebook has also exponentially increased. And as I just said, violating age restrictions is extremely common with parental facilitation. Um, and so the summaries of usage in 2013 look like this. You can see Ireland up there and you can see the UK. So the graph split two ways. And we can see that um, there on the horizontal axis, uh, children aged 13 to 16, and Ireland just over, where is it, where is it, where is it? 80% of people in that age group had a Facebook account and then about 35% of those between the ages of nine and 12. Um, so we're dealing with an awful lot of children who are on Facebook, including those who aren't even meant to be there. It was considered, Facebook has been considering and putting various kind of patents in place for technologies that will help give kids access with adult facilitation. That actually hasn't happened officially yet, but I think that with children on Facebook in such large numbers, it's probably only a matter of time until Facebook figures out of time to turn this into money. Um, and so, um, like I said, I don't want to make the mistake again of assuming too much about what you guys know about what Facebook is and how it works, uh, but it's only one of what we might call thanatechnological phenomena that have arisen in the digital age. So this is where 
technology and death intersect in all sorts of ways and in all sorts of different kinds of structures. Everything from uh, patient blogging when they're in palliative care or hospice care sort of towards their imminent death. There's bereavement support communities. There's online cemeteries, which have been around for a while, which is specifically for the purpose of posting memorials and eulogizations and photographs that are, you know, after the person is dead. Grief blogs uh, kept by individuals. Uh, bereavement in online communities. Remote attendance funerals via video Skype or sort of a streaming video technology. Um, and the two things that I'm interested in and that this uh, is about are repurposed social networking sites. So that means that you had a Facebook profile in life and then one day you die and it's still there and it becomes something else. It becomes a site for mourning and memorialization. Um, and then just the general concept of not just Facebook but of all of the digital legacy that we leave behind when we die, which can include in everything from sort of financial information and sort of like contributions that we made when we reviewed things on travel websites and so on and so forth um, to the social networking sites that you set up. So all, yeah, so most people today are cobbling together quite a, a vivid digital picture of who they were that sticks around for quite a long time after they die and there's no sort of blanket way of sort of removing that. Um, so Facebook is a representation of self, that's true. You set it up, um, you decide to do it one day, you set it up, you decide which pictures to upload, whom to add, who not to add. And so I suppose in one way it can be construed as being about you as an individual, but actually, it's much more of a representation of self in relation. So it's a co-constructed entity. So you're having conversations with people, it, there are dialogues that are visible to everyone. And so information is coming together from you and all of your network of friends to create something that is ostensibly kind of about you. So as a co-constructed thing with lots of material from lots of different people, it's actually quite different than uh, something that's other things that are owned by the deceased, like a thing like that you might pass on in your will or instruct your family what I want done with this after I die, uh, because it's it's a, it's a strange kind of co-owned, -co co-constructed kind of entity that's maybe more complex, even on sort of a legal or copyright or philosophical perspective than you might imagine, and that's visual. Uh, because it's one of the uh, major uh, sites along with Instagram for sharing photographs and verbal in terms of all the conversations that you have with people and all the kind of repository of comments that go back and forth. So people make decisions about regulating their privacy on Facebook uh, during life. Uh, they might decide, okay, I want to post these timeline postings from everyone, uh, I keep these from everybody and just want to see them myself. I want to share them with this subgroup of people, I want just with my friends list, with the whole world. And so there's a whole lot of privacy setting evolution on Facebook and people trying to keep pace with this um, to make sure that the level of access that they're allowing to themselves is the level of access that they really want. Um, but there's so much information about themselves, of course, going up. And Facebook explicitly positioned itself a couple years ago as a place for your autobiography to be built. And so they said, so introducing timeline, tell your life story with a new kind of profile, one that begins with little baby there, a nappy, born on July 10th I was, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, and then ending with, well, there's not yet a little coffin icon that occurs at the other end of this, uh, but oftentimes people don't know that they're going to die. Uh, they, a lot of the researchers uh, that I, uh, the, the research participants that I talked to, had lost uh, friends through sudden accidents, uh, and sometimes, as in this case here. Um, this, uh, this fellow who is a friend of a friend, I had permission both from both his family and my friend to use this example. Um, one day he posted on Facebook this picture and said, this is how I'd like to be remembered. And the next day he committed suicide. And so, and the, my friend's comment on that was, you never know when a Facebook comment will be the last you'll hear from someone. Well, of course, increasingly, a Facebook comment may be the last you hear from someone, uh, given the extent to which we communicate via this forum. June 2014, how many, active Facebook users were there, 1.32 billion. Okay, so the crude death rate worldwide, let's say the crude death rate overall for the world population is about eight per 1,000 every year. So what we'd be talking about if we applied that same crude death rate to the Facebook population, even if we make adjustments for the fact that people are younger, they're from more privileged countries where there's less illness and more resources, you're still talking about millions and millions and millions of people dying that are Facebook users every year. So there's a tremendous number of profiles of dead people scattered amongst the profiles of the living on Facebook. Okay? And what happens, it's a couple of different things. One, one thing I would say is, 
previously, when Facebook uh, put something in the memorialized status, you'd get in contact with them, they'd say, you'd say so-and-so has died, could you place this profile into memorialized status? Uh, that would mean that everything, all the posts would revert to friends only, and certain functions would stop. So you'd stop getting sort of uh, notifications like, oh, it's so-and-so's birthday today, wish him or her a happy birthday, or you'd stop getting notifications that say, oh, so-and-so posted on that person's timeline, or something like that. So that would stop and everything would revert to friends only. I wrote a paper in 2013 questioning this because of the, the, the privacy settings that somebody puts on represents their privacy preferences in life. So they say, these are the people that I want to have access to me, these are the people that I don't, this is what I want public, this is what I want private. And so then to sort of apply a blanket policy to that after death, I question that. And then interestingly, Facebook did this using some of the same vocabularies in my article. They didn't actually talk to me, but it's happy. I'm, I'm happy if they sort of were thinking about these things because they didn't, Facebook wasn't set up to have to think about these things. It just cared about connecting people. At first it was just people at universities in the U.S. and then it sort of expanded beyond that. But now they're having to ask themselves these big questions with all these millions of people that are dead on their site. So they're saying, well, how might people feel? Are we honoring the wishes of the deceased? Are we taking care? All those kinds of things. So they're evolving their policy all of the time. But their policy includes the fact that in a, a next of kin, an immediate family member, if they can provide the documentation that this post somebody has died and they say, I want this profile taken down, Facebook will do that. In cases where the person has made some sort of other wish known, like in a digital will, saying that I want this Facebook profile to stick around, families would actually have to take Facebook to court, as the mother in Brazil uh, did last, in the news last year, to petition Facebook to have it taken down. Um, so that's how things stand with respect to what happens now when somebody dies on Facebook and Facebook is informed. Huge diversity of opinions about this. These are just a cl few clips from uh, uh, the mass media in terms of positive things. Help me say goodbye. You know, it helps me grieve. It helps people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the other side of the coin is that lots of things worry people. Death notification really bothers people. They seem to feel that death notification via Facebook is a terrible thing. Somebody should put a stop to it. It's just not right. It's not human. Uh, the, there's the Brazil story about the memorial page being removed. Um, there's a, if a person, as now Facebook has this policy that the privacy settings remain the, the same as the, as the person said it when they were alive, mom and dad might very well not have been on that friends list. There may have been very good reasons for the person having chosen that. And then when the parents come afterwards and say, oh, my child has died, I want to see their Facebook. Facebook page and Facebook says, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you aren't included on the friends list and that's the way it has to be. Obviously, this, uh, cert uh, certain feelings are going to come up about that. Uh, that was the Facebook ban me from my dead daughter's page to protect her privacy bit there. Um, and so there's a, a number of different concerns, obviously, that people have and it seems to unsettle them that these phenomena are occurring uh, with regard to death and Facebook. So the contrast between the Brazil story and the same news, in the same news week, there was quite a different story from the other side of the world. So it, in uh, this father in Australia, his, his son actually died as, um, in circumstances associated with cyberbullying. He had been cyberbullied and he committed suicide. And even under those circumstances, he said it would be terrible, it would be unbearable to remove my son's Facebook page. It's just too important. It's a kind of a hologram of who he was. Uh, you know, and in fact, when his friend stopped posting or the, the rate slowed down, it was disappointing because I was worried that it meant that he would be forgotten. Meanwhile, the mother in Brazil had a very, very different take on it. And it wasn't that anyone was posting anything negative or anything like that. In fact, you know, they were wonderful messages, they were wonderful photographs, and she apparently just couldn't keep herself from looking at these things. It was troubling her so much, she called it a wailing wall. And she said she was just so popular and I cried every time I saw this stuff and I just couldn't stand for it to be out in the world anymore, basically, and I had to have it taken down. So just as in offline situations, you know, it's horses for courses, what, what one parent, you know, finds unbearable, one par parent relies upon very strongly for helping cope in their grief. Um, and so thinking about these kind of grief processes and grief theory that we're familiar with and, and how does this kind of manifest or express itself in the online context, let's just think about this for a minute in terms of what Facebook can do and the, the grief theory and the bereavement theory that we already know. So the searching and calling kind of function, you know, perhaps particularly in the immediate aftermath of a death, um, but so looking for the person who's been lost, seeking, scanning, wanting to locate the dead, feeling drawn to the place where they were last seen, where they might l most likely be found, and wanting to call out to them and communicate to them and sort of make contact or have a feeling of contact in some kind of way. Parks and Ferguson quote here, when someone's lost, the most natural place to look for them is the place where they were last seen. 
And let's just reflect uh, for a moment on how often it's the case that you know we kind of see a friend's kind of profile or sort of like check in with a friend via their profile if we haven't seen them recently in, in the flesh. Oscillating, dual process model of grief. Um, so going back and forth between mourning and the orientation to the loss and being in the loss and then attending to your ongoing life and attending to its demands and then being brought back into the awareness of the loss. So this oscillation between approach and avoidance. And I would argue that the mobile nature of a lot of our technologies and the fact that these profiles are scattered amongst one another, dead and living, and the way you can click in and click out really kind of in a way facilitates this kind of oscillation and incorporation of the swinging between orientation to loss and orientation to living on a day-to-day -day basis. Continuing the bond. I mean, continuing bonds theory talks about how relationships change with death, but that, that continuing the bond is, is normal and adaptive and comforting, which everybody sort of thought and sort of went along with until Freud came along and said, no, you have to close it down, you have to move on, you have to decathect, you have to invest your energy in other things. But now, at least in the academic circles, continuing bonds theory and dual processing uh, models you know, are very well known and very accepted, but still, every time a journalist asks me a question or a layperson in the world asks me a question who's not an academic, they say, oh, but they haven't moved on, they need to close it down, they haven't sort of resolved it. They still have this idea that death work means that you close it up and you kind of move on and you don't kind of think about you know, these things very much anymore. Um, Dennis Class, the continuing bonds, uh, one of the uh, continuing bonds theorists, talks about continuing bonds as being collectively held. He said this involves the social identities of the dead, social identities of the survivors, and the bonds of the dead person are interwoven with the bonds of the other dead and with other living people. And this is essentially being played out in a very, very obvious way um, on Facebook and other social networking sites that have dead people's profiles on them that people continue to connect with. And finally, Tony Walter, University of Bath, uh, talks about durable biographies. And he says, you know, one of the purposes of grief when people come together at a funeral, when they eulogize the person, when they have conversations about the dead person, one of the things that's happening there is that survivors are kind of arriving at a narrative, a biography of this deceased person that feels accurate, that feels stable, and they can kind of go, yeah, this is who this person is, and this is the picture that we move forward with, and this is negotiated within the community of mourners. And he said, unfortunately, and this is 1996, and it shows you how much things have changed. He said, these others might not be readily available in a mobile, secular, and bureaucratic society that separates work from home, or disrupts tradition and ritual and rootedness in place. Well, now the digital sphere is very much a place where kind of the communities occur and where people are extremely interconnected. And so a lot, a lot, a lot has changed since Tony wrote that about, you know, so gosh, almost 20 years ago now. Okay, so summing up, internet can be facilitative and they can readily search out locate and contact the dead via Facebook profiles. Oftentimes, Facebook is a major, major, major means of death notification. A lot of people tear their hair out about that. However, it also means that you immediately connect in with a community of mourners at that point. The point that you find out is also the moment that you can start having conversations and talking to other people who are in grief and sort of saying what happened and what are you doing and what shall we do and shall we go to the family and so on and so forth. And so the internet is often the first place that people find out about things and the first place that people seek help from others. And it can happen 24 seven. It can happen in the dark you know, hours of the early morning when nobody else is around and when formerly you would have been isolated, you can click into this community of mourners. It facilitates that oscillation between mourning and engagement in everyday life. Clearly facilitates continuing bonds with what can be a very vivid representation of what that person was, much more so than a, a gravestone or some sort of other kind of memorial. Um, and the person who left that, memor that, that legacy behind had significant input into that durable biography. They edited and curated and sort of showed themselves um, to the world via their Facebook profile. So they had a lot of input into that. However, there's the problems that everybody is concerned about. Negative reactions to death notification via Facebook. Worrying about marginalization of certain groups of mourners. Ironically, the family, the social networking era is the era of the friend. You know, formerly, it was the family who would have the boxes of photographs in the attic and all the communications and the boxes of letters and all this sort of stuff that belonged to the deceased, yeah? There are no more boxes of photographs in the attic or lead boxes of letters or whatever it is. Um, it, and it's the friends who are more likely to have access to these things than the family because oftentimes, especially amongst young people, the family might be excluded from uh, these, 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 these sites. Um, so the concern about managing this digital legacy 
Is the profile retained? Is the profile removed? Uh, trauma associated with profile removal, trauma that the family might not even realize is a possibility when they petition Facebook for the profile to be removed. Uh, concerns about bereaved individuals, about mourners from friends who, or family who don't understand you know, why you're continuing to talk to your dead friend on Facebook or why you're on the profile all the time. It just doesn't seem right. It just doesn't seem healthy. It occasions worry. Yeah. And then there's the phenomenon of internet trolling. And when people talk to me about this, they sometimes talk about it as though the internet it has sort of created the possibility or sort of provoked the, the tendency to, um, to say bad things uh, uh, you know, on, uh, on the uh, memorial pages of, of people who've died, for example. All I would say to that is, is that we probably wouldn't have the very ancient expression, don't speak ill of the dead, unless people had been speaking Ill, Ill of the dead for an awfully long time. The problem now is, of course, is that even though we used to kind of think of digital information as quite ephemeral and fleeting or whatever it is, it's actually not ephemeral at all. It's extraordinarily kind of permanent sometimes. And so if somebody puts a nasty comment up on a Facebook page or some other sort of site, it, it takes an effort to remove it. It needs to be scrubbed in some kind of way. Some, somebody needs to be notified. There's probably a form that needs to be filled out or something like this. You know, and, and that's very different than somebody busting into a funeral and sort of screaming something terrible and everybody hushes it up and takes the person out and that's that, you know, and nobody ever hears about it again except in memory. This is different. Uh, and so it's the same kind of behavior, but the context has an impact on how much impact that behavior has. Okay. So really, really quickly, just to highlight a few things about my own research. One of the things I want to emphasize about research in this area in general is that it's almost all qualitative, and it's, it's, it, there's a huge amount of convergence. So there's a lot of qualitative research doesn't have statistical generalizability, but it does have theoretical transferability. And what I would say is the theoretical transferability of the stuff coming out of all of this qualitative research is very strong because everybody comes up with the same stuff. They sort of design their own studies in their own kind of way in Australia or the United States, the UK, or whatever it is. And they look at this phenomenon, and they come up with the same kinds of uh, conclusions. And so even though there hasn't been some sort of large scale sort of quantitative research into topics such as, for example, is digitally or technologically mediated mourning, you know, different to, similar to, sort of traditional, you know, are there risk factors, all these kinds of things that people wonder about, like, oh, isn't that worrying, or isn't that more dangerous, or isn't that more risky? You might have that feeling as like an instinct that might be personally driven or driven by your experience, but just know that as of now, there is no evidence that w there was no strong, there's, there's only these qualitative studies that have this theoretical convergence. So I just want to highlight that before I start uh, because it might affect some of the questions that, uh, that you ask. So my own methodology was a multi-strategy approach where I looked at five in-memory groups um, and I, am, it, it, I subjected all of the comments and the kind of dialogue on the, those groups to qualitative data analysis. And then I interviewed three people who administered these groups. So these were bereaved individuals who managed the in-memory groups, the, like in, in, in the RIP groups or the memorial groups on Facebook, but they also had access to the person's in-life profile, which I didn't have access to because I wasn't on the friends list. That I wanted to, them to tell me about the differences between what was going on in the memory group and what was going on in the, how the interaction with the in-life group and how they interacted with these differently or how they seemed to be different. Okay. Um, and they came up with sort of four general kinds of themes. One of them being modes of address. And um, you'll see this in the results of all, everybody else's research as well with uh, direct communication, with second person address, talking directly to the deceased. So basically all the digital natives, all of the people who have grown up with interacting in social networking profiles on this way, will always just carry on talking to the person exactly as they always have. If they talk, if they use profanity before, they'll keep on using it. If they use text speak before, they'll keep on using it. They, they won't suddenly start talking about the person in the third person or go all polite or go all formal or anything like that. That won't happen. They'll just carry on as per usual. Whereas if some older person kind of comes on to a memorial group that doesn't usually, they'll sort of say, dear Eve and John, I'm so sorry to hear about Matthew. And they'll sort of like essentially do a formal condolence letter in the middle of all of these other kinds of things where the person's uh, speaking directly to the person. So di digital immigrants and digital natives often behave quite differently when interacting uh, on, a, on a profile after someone's died. One of the most fascinating things about uh, this phenomenon is the beliefs about communications reaching the deceased, because this is an article of faith for digital natives. Um, I'm not quite sure what this is about, 
but they um, believe that Facebook is an effective and uh, efficient means of getting hold of the deceased directly. Um, and irrespective of the fact of whether they're religious or not, or kind of think about things in terms of a religious afterlife or not. They don't believe, obviously, that the person gets back to them on Facebook. They're under no illusions that the person is dead. If anything, the Facebook page underlines the fact that the person is dead because the person stopped making contributions to the profile at a certain point and it instantly became a site of memorialization. So oftentimes the page is something that drives home the fact that the person is dead, not something that enables the person to deny it. So, but they'll say things like, okay, uh, they'll speak directly to the person, they'll say, oh, thanks for that dream you sent me, or thanks for that rainbow you sent me, or thank you for keeping me from going over the median when I almost fell asleep in the car. So they'll sort of say, okay, I'm talking to you like this, and you're talking to me via natural phenomena, or via intercessions, or via some other means. And they'll refer to those return communications in their communications to the person. Um, and so, and I asked them uh, about whether they felt, uh, how they felt that that sense of connection or communication compared to other kinds of practices. So going to visit the place of internment or going to be amongst the person's stuff, like in their room or whatever. And they would say, well, you know, I could talk to her, I guess, you know, but I wouldn't be sure if she could hear me or I wouldn't really necessarily feel that she was hearing me if I were talking to her at the grave site. But if I email her, if I put a message on her, I know she gets that. And I'd say, well, what's that about? And I was like, well, I know, I know. I, I don't know why. I just believe it. I just do. You know? And this is absolutely fascinating. And I, I, I have my own hypothesis about this, which is that if you write somebody an email, or if you send somebody a text message, and you don't get an out-of-office reply, or you, you, know, you know they're there, you know they're in the office, and the email hasn't bounced back, and say it's something that you really kind of need word on, you know, you need them to get back to you. And a day goes by and a couple days go by. Are you sitting there thinking, oh, it's so strange that she's not getting her email. She must not have read my email yet. She must not have picked it up. You're not thinking that. You're like, I know you've seen my email. Why aren't you getting back to me? Basically, to send a text or to send an email is to sort of experience it as received because it's so instantaneous. You know, and if somebody doesn't get back to you, that's because they're being, you know, laggardly about it, not because they haven't received it. And I think that especially for people who've grown up with this instantaneousness, that to sort of click this means that the person's got it, it's almost like that kind of feeling or that kind of lived experience just carries on, that kind of assumption or that, that they know it's not logical, but it just that's how it feels. To send means that it's being received. But this is something that I really, really want my students to kind of, uh, kind of design something clever to kind of research because I think I want to understand uh, this belief. Um, the continuing bond thing comes through very strongly in all the research uh, that you see. Uh, the comfort derived from it, the vividness of the telepresence of the person on this kind of site, on their social network, that's partly because it isn't just about the individual. There's this whole memory of your relationship and your conversations, and you're really kind of tapping in to the quality of your interaction and your relationship with them, as well as you are tapping into their personality as they showed it on, on Facebook. They're very invested in maintaining that bond to include kind of frequent visits and, and sometimes messages. They will communicate very everyday communication, newsy kind of stuff, like, oh, hey, guess what? We won the game, you know, this happened, you know, so-and-so had their christening, whatever it is. And what's so interesting about this is that people don't seem to be assuming, well, they're dead, they're omniscient, they're looking down from heaven, they know the christening happened, they know the score of the game, they know whatever. They kind of think, oh, well, I'm the reporter of this, I need to kind of like go and tell you about it. And in fact, you see people saying things on the sites like, I'm really sorry I didn't wish you happy birthday on your actual birthday, I was somewhere where there wasn't an internet connection. So they kind of basically didn't think, I can go out and I can look at the sky and say, happy birthday, because they're th thinking, well, that won't work. I have to wait till I get to the internet cafe so I can get this through to them. And that essentially indirectly expresses that belief again that people talk to me about explicitly. It implicitly sort of says, this is how I get hold of you. There isn't any other way. Um, so again, which is something that I find as a digital immigrant myself quite fascinating. Okay, so then there's lots of nature and function of the community that there seems to be. Uh, it is a source of comfort and help and of information and information in the aftermath of a death or on the anniversary of people's deaths or kind of um, observations that people might be making or gatherings that there might be, uh, rides to the funeral, whatever it is. Um, and, and people almost sort of trying to kind of like 
when they sort of share their memories, you can kind of see, obviously people knew people in different capacities or people had different takes on them, and so you can sort of see that kind of negotiation of the person's biography in, in terms of kind of what per, kind of person they were happening, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the comments. But it can also be a source of conflict or competition uh, for chief mourner kind of status in terms of like who knew them best, you know, who is their best friend, who, um, you know, who has the right to do the in-memory page. I heard, I talked to some uh, research participants who said, well, I set up a memorial page for my cousin, and then some girl in school, she set up an in-memory page for him, and then she was trying to get everybody to go to her in-memory page, and it was just, it wasn't on, and so I went and told her that, you know, so basically, um, so sometimes it, it's, uh, it's something that um, uh, kind of uh, gets involved in this whole kind of chief mourner competition that, again, you saw in the analog age, you see it all the time, but it's just playing out in a different context, in a different forum. Um, so the convergence of findings that I'm talking about, pretty much everything that you look at um, kind of has similar kind of themes happening, and it's almost universally encouraging or positive or just sort of saying this is, this is something that is more likely to be facilitative and helpful than it is to be kind of harmful. It's very hard to find any kind of research that says this is a concerning phenomenon that indicates that there's some risk associated with technologically me mediated mourning or memorialization. Um, <laughs> at your leisure, you can look at all of those. Um, and we'll be sending the slides out, um, as Britt said. Okay, so what does this mean for you to, as practitioners? As I say, some things, I'm hoping that already you're kind of thinking, oh, well, maybe this kind of fits a little bit better than I imagined. But there are, so in some respects, it is a case of the more things change, the more they stay the same. But there are some things that are brought into the picture by the context that actually do feel new and feel potentially challenging. And one of them is this death notifications via Facebook thing. Again, death notifications and hearing about somebody who has died that you cared about, of course this is nothing new and it's always horrific. Personally, uh, I'm not sure that I would feel more or less horrified by the police knocking on my door or the memory of the phone call or the moment that somebody sat me down with a funny look on their face and told me something than I would seeing it via these means. Maybe that's just me. Uh, but there does seem to be a knee-jerk kind of feeling like it's especially horrific to hear it in, in this way. Um, I think this just needs to be recognized that increasingly this is the rule rather than the exception. You know, if a meteor hit this building right now and landed over there and maybe injured someone, the police or the newspapers wouldn't be the first people to convey that information. Somebody would probably email about it or tweet about it or they'd send a message to somebody. Somebody in this room would be in charge of reporting that and it would be spread like wildfire in that kind of way before the police or the news media ever had a chance to hear about it. In fact, the news media now, what they do is they sit around and they look at Twitter feeds and they look for their story. They like research story by other people. So everybody's a journalist now and the journalists are sort of the collators of all the layperson journalists kind of information, okay? So I think you really kind of need to kind of stay reflexively aware of your kind of personal negative reactions, uh, you know, to have to learn of this death in such a way and all these kinds of things and think of what informs those. And to remember that just because death notification happens in that way, it doesn't mean that you don't have access to other people around you and it does also means that you're immediately connected into that supportive network that is already having a conversation and consoling each other and exchanging information in the same form that the notification just happened. And so, you know, and, and to, and, and, and for digital natives in particular, the fact that there might not other be, be other people physically present in the room does not mean that you automatically feel alone, that there is no one there, that in fact, actually, people often feel together with and in a community with and sharing the, and feel very connected to people in the online for unless you so to say, oh, it's so terrible to find out about something when there's nobody there. That's almost a kind of pre-digital age analog kind of assumption that the physical absence of people makes it feel like there's nobody there. That's kind of no long, that, that's often not the case for digital natives. Okay. Responding to marginalized mourners. Now I said before that, you know, traditional inner circle mourners, that, that was the family. They had the most access to kind of the memories of the deceased person. And dis other mourners, including friends and including children, uh, might have been marginalized. 
These are for two reasons. So the friends were outside the family, you know, the family again was the inner circle. But then when it comes to children as well, we've got to remember that oftentimes, and this is one of the reasons that, you know, the, the childhood bereavement networks do the work with families that they do, adults are not automatically good at responding to and talking about and staying open to and like their kid. In fact, often in the name of protecting children's delicate sensitivities or sensibilities or you know not wanting them to know that there's terrible things like death in the world or whatever it is, they may hide things and not want to talk about it and discourage the child from talking about it and all those kinds of things. Meanwhile, the child is aware of it and the child is sad and the child is wondering and the child does need somebody to talk to and the adults aren't always there either because they're going through their own stuff or they're concerned about the child or a combination thereof. And so, and so now, actually, there is a, a forum for children to be sort of talking about the loss of a friend or a family member when the adults in their household aren't sort of ready for that. And so, but with respect to Facebook and the kind of inner circle that that creates, you know, here all of these friends have all of this access to all of these memories of the person and the family might not even know that they had a Facebook page. They might, well, they probably will know that they had a Facebook page. They're always on their phone, whatever it is. But they might not have had access to it. And let's say the friends decide that it would be a kind thing or at the request of the family to see the, the, all the stuff that there's there on the Facebook profile. Is this necessarily going to be a straightforward situation where the family sitting there is saying, oh, gosh, no, it's so wonderful to have all of this? Not necessarily. You know, as I say, there might be a good reason why mom and dad were kept very strongly away <laughs> from the Facebook material. Wild parties and inappropriate clothing and, oh, that happened and, oh, my God, that doesn't look very good. And families might think, this is not how I want my child's legacy in the world to be. This is not how I'd want my child to be remembered. And that might be very, very distressing enough to have the profile uh, uh, removal request uh, sent to Facebook. Also, they might, just the fact of finding out things and sort of having a bit of a different picture of their cherished son or their cherished daughter, a more complex picture, that might be something that emerges and that might need processing and that might need some intervention um, because the kind of durable biography that the parents kind of want to have of their child going forward might be threatened by some of the information that they find out on a social networking site. I mentioned the chief mourner position, and I already told you the story about the competing memorial sites. Uh, but then, of course, there's this wrangling over like who's kind of got the right to manage the dead person's legacy or the dead person's image. You know, like, you know, so if somebody's cousin, set, if somebody's sister sets up an in memory of page, somebody's friend sets up an in memory of page. You know, who's really kind of got the right to do that, or who's got the right to remove the Facebook profile altogether? And this is a big thing. This is one of the reasons that I'm happy when stuff goes into the um, mass media about it and people get thinking about this because I think the profile removal uh, is, is a really, really traumatizing event uh, for uh, a lot of people who really rely on the Facebook profile persisting to be able to uh, to, to, to mourn and to memorialize. Uh, my own research participants had an overriding fear and that was profile removal. They felt very insecure in terms of what if one day it wasn't there anymore. You know, I just, what if I logged on and all of that stuff was, was gone. Um, not only are they experiencing it already as a way of contacting or connecting or communicating with the deceased, but also that's just, that's the site where they've located their dead friends or their dead, you know, loved one. Um, and if it vanishes, um, it can be extremely, extremely traumatic. So it's about partly about assisting your clients in living with the anxiety of that possibility, uh, but I think it's also about sort of psychoeducation with families who might be grappling with the decision of whether to retain or remove a profile. Uh, you know, and, uh, and sometimes parents may not be aware of the traumatic effect that it might have on others. Some parents who are next of kin who are concerned about the nature of the legacy on Facebook, they might not care. Uh, they might think, well, no matter what, I just need to get that off of there. Um, but I think at the very least, people need to be sensitized to what these profiles represent to people in, in the modern day grieving landscape. But if the profile is retained, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a straightforward thing to manage. Um, 
If the profile isn't memorialized, as I say, you'll continue to get notifications like, oh, post on so-and-so's timeline for their birthday, or they'll give you sort of send you reminders, or suggest, you know, so-and-so likes this. Well, in, why are dead people liking stuff on Facebook? That's the, the headline down below. Whereas sometimes that's phenomenon where it says, oh, your friend so-and-so liked this. Well, they might have liked that sort of two years ago, but Facebook decides for whatever reason to kind of pop that up again. Uh, when that's memorialized, it doesn't happen, but not everybody thinks to notify Facebook book about the death of the person. So, so that means that if you're kind of going along about your everyday life and then something kind of surprises you uh, at an unexpected time or a time or place that feels difficult, that can be quite difficult to manage. Um, sometimes people impulsively defriend um, a dead loved one and then change their mind about it but then it's too late because the friend is no longer there to approve your new friend request. So you can kind of lose access to all of that um, without necessarily having fully thought it through or because you're finding it too upsetting in that moment and then can't go back. Um, so positioning yourself theoretically, as I say, you know, I really strongly feel from my research and all the other research that I read that it fits very, very well with an existing um, kind of theoretical models. So, and I think that this can help people that think, okay, well, even if like I don't have anything much to do with social networking myself, or even though I don't understand, or even though I wouldn't choose to do it, at least I can understand how these phenomena kind of fit in with if, with. Uh, with theories that I'm familiar with, including continuing bonds or including dual processing mod models. So I think that if you really kind of situate yourself like that, it really helps you more clearly conceptualize things, intervene, think about decisions about where on this something might sit. Because believe me, I've talked to a lot of bereavement professionals who, by dint of the mere fact that somebody is continuing to interact with their loved one on profile, they'll be like, oh my god, level three, level four, you know, this is bad. You know, they're at much more risk of suicidality because of the, you know, whatever. And it's like this assumptive leap that's not based on anything but their own kind of personal kind of stuff but it's causing them to kind of assess the child differently than they would if they kind of knew more about and had reflected more about their own kind of, you know, sort of positioning with respect to uh, social networking phenomena. So when I say emerging norms, again, I want to say that these are not statistical norms because nobody's done any sort of large-scale quantitative study on this kind of thing, on risk, on, on, on usage, on incidents. Not, this just doesn't exist. What exists is a, a lot of qualitative studies that have a lot of convergence in terms of what seems to be the, the themes and, and what seems to be common. Um, so typical, so let's not say statistical norms, let's say typical. Um, Belief in communications reaching the deceased, again, just seems to be an article of faith that people seem to treat it like that. Um, visits to profiles do seem to be frequent. It's very easy to do. They seem to be over long terms, uh, months, years. Um, and those visits seem to be very much woven into the everyday, and communications are woven into the everyday, particularly at first, and as would be expected, the frequency tails off over time. Uh, but oftentimes people continue to kind of check in at key moments when they're reminded of something, or when there's an anniversary of the death, or when there's a holiday or a birthday or something like that. Uh, they'll tend to kind of go on and, and send messages at that point. And that's just, that is the new normal. That is what's, what, what people do. It's extremely typical um, mourning bereavement behavior. Um, which is why um, other mourners that are concerned about people doing this may need to be reassured because people say, oh, no, they're in denial, and it's just this creepy. It's, it's it, the headline that Sorka Pollock had in the Irish Times said, is this a morbid preoccupation? And this seems to reflect you know, the fears of, of, of parents or grandparents or carers about what it means when their kid's on Facebook. And they also might be concerned about this informal way. Like I said before, people just carry on talking the way they talked before. And if that included profanity or bad spelling or loads of exclamation points or LOLs or whatever it is, they'll just keep doing that. But, and then people from you know, the pre-digital kind of era when there wasn't all this text speak around, they think, well, this is just really inappropriate. You know, they're, they're dead. There needs to be some sanctity here. You need to be kind of more formal about things. But that's just not, that's just not the way it is. Um, so there may be a considerable need for kind of reflection and psychoeducation uh, around this with family members who are worried. And like I said before, just reflecting on your personal attitudes, when I did some qualitative research, I uh, made this thing called a digital age technologies attitude scale. And I've done a cross-disciplinary, it was just for psychologists, but I've done a cross-disciplinary uh, version of it. And it's a tool for self-reflection about how you position yourself with respect to digital age technologies and how you kind of think about it in your, both your personal and your professional life and the intersection of your personal and professional life. It's a 60-item scale. But in service of constructing that scale, what I did is I did a, a big 
qualitative interviews with uh, counseling psychologists. So two trainees, two early to mid-career, and two mid to late career, which then also kind of mapped onto age, sort of an age range thing. And uh, in all of those interviews, um, people were, and counseling psychologists are very concerned with relational aspects and the kind of, you know, relational communication and so forth. And, um, and so they were all sort of saying, you know, I'm, I'm kind of worried that it doesn't really constitute real relationship. It's not real relationship. It's not real communications. It's not real. And, and that was also the case for the, for the trainees who were in their sort of 20s. Um, and so that's often this knee-jerk kind of feeling for people who are digital immigrants in particular, uh, but it doesn't conform to what digital natives or people who are very au fait with it say it feels like for them, their, their lived experience, uh, that it absolutely feels like a real relationship or real communication. Uh, and yes, does it, is it different in some ways than sort of sitting with somebody face to face? Perhaps, but not as different as you might think. And in some cases, there's even a greater feeling of intimacy or connection in technologically mediated communication. And once you've done that reflection, kind of think, okay, these biases that I have, these beliefs, these emotions, these attitudes that I've, uh, that I've identified, how might these affect my work with somebody when they come in and, and mourning on Facebook or mourning via some other kind of technologically mediated means is important or it's a really significant part of their process? How might that mean that I judge them? How might that mean that I respond? How might that mean that I assess them on this pyramid thing? You know, what might this mean my concerns are for them? And, and what kinds of kind of reflexive attitude raising kind of pro, uh, uh, um, awareness raising pra uh, practices can you engage in to help you unpack these and to monitor these? Because this isn't, I mean, this is only the beginning. Somebody pointed out to me in a talk that I did last night at the Psychological Society of Ireland that probably won't be long before we're literally dealing with holograms. The father in Australia talked about how a Facebook profile felt like a hologram of his son. Eventually, there probably will be holograms, you know, and it might not be in the far too distant future. So it's just the beginning of, of, of what will continue to evolve and be possible. And there isn't any turning back the clock. You know, we're not going to return to an age where suddenly we don't have death of notifications by Facebook anymore. This is just not, it's, or, or by whatever, whatever a social media usurp Facebook along down the line in popularity. Here's what I really want my students to do. <laughs> I, I, was, I was telling somebody last night that I used to like supervise, oh, okay, if I know the methodology, fine, I'll supervise you. And I've kind of gotten to the point in my career now, I was like, yeah, I don't feel like supervising you unless I'm really, really interested in something. In fact, can you just do what I want you to do? Because and this is what I want them to do. Um, I really, I don't, so because, partly because there's this knee-jerk thing, they're saying, oh, there must be risk factors here. They're, they're, the analog kind of grief must be different than technologically mediated grief. I kind of have a feeling theoretically that it's not all that different, but I would prefer to prove it <laughs> uh, by engaging uh, in, in more generalizable um, kind of large-scale research that really looks at whether there are any differences or greater risk factors associated with technologically mediated mourning than there are with, with other types of, of, of mourning. Um, I am really interested in how now that people are more and more aware that we leave behind these digital legacies, you know, it used to be that people were you know, a lot, five years ago or so, people were thinking, just waking up to the fact that, oh, you mean stuff that I put online could hurt me with respect to employability, or my future career, or my aim to be prime minister, or whatever it is. And now people are still thinking about that, of course, and rightly concerned about that. But they're also concerned about the fact that they're more aware that what they put online now will still be around after they die, and that it is forming part of their digital legacy. So people are being able to be more conscious about that. And I'm curious, as to how that is altering, if it is, the way that people present themselves in life. And I am completely fascinated to understand more about the nature of this belief about communication reaching the dead on Facebook, and if it maps onto what my kind of hypothesis is, that it's just a natural extension of this lived experience of to send is to have it received, or whether it's more complex than that, whether it, the internet is the new heaven, and we think, oh great, we've got just easier access to heaven than we used to, is right there. Um, you know, so I really want to understand more about this, which I presume has all sorts of philosophical, sociological, psychological, metaphysical tales to it. So I think it's going to have to be a multidisciplinary kind of uh, team working on that latter one. Uh, but those are some of just the few trajectories for future research that I think are important um, with respect to this area. This is the uh, issue of bereavement care. Some of you might have it on your shelves and might not have looked at it at the time. Uh, summer of 2012, all the articles in it were about uh, technologically mediated uh, mourning and bereavement. Um, there's a book. 
It was published in 2012. I did a couple of book reviews for it, and in the book reviews I was forced to say, look, I have a lot of sympathy with these people because I know how long it takes to take a book from the manuscript to the publication process, and with this kind of topic and that amount of time, things move on a lot. <laughs> so, the, so by the time it hit the shelves, it already looked a little bit like behind the times because that's just how fast things move. Uh, but it is out there. It does give you kind of a sense of the scope, but it's for um, counselors and educators and researchers it's, it's, got, it's also aims at a pretty wide audience, so it's the kind of book that you kind of might to, need to dip in and say, right, which parts of this are really relevant for me. Um, and this is a, a, um, accessible online. Uh, this is the article that I talked about that I wondered if Facebook had was influenced by when they reworked their uh, policy on privacy settings and what happens to memorialized profiles. And so um, that was a special issue that had to do with postmortem privacy. A couple of colleagues of mine who are lawyers and other people who are interested in postmortem privacy contributed to this as well. But this has to do um, with uh, things around privacy regulation theory and also the traumatic impact of profile removal. That article has to do with that. Um, and that's out there to be seen. And how do I hope this has helped you? I was going to tell you that, but it's that's. Not really not transparent. That's supposed to be transparent. You're going to have to tell me how this has helped you rather than me telling you. So I'll finish with that and take any questions. And I would really like to hear how this presentation has influenced you, particularly if you were coming in here thinking, yeah, I don't think this is going to be important to me. Yeah? Thank you very much. <laughs>